Good morning, guys. Good afternoon and a very happy Monday. Hope you guys had a fantastic weekend. Hope you guys are doing well today. Let me, before I say hello to everybody, welcome my guest host this morning, that 70s rock fan. Well, good morning and I'm honoured uh, to be invited to join you today. Thank you very much. Only for you, my dear, could I get up at this ungodly hour in the Pacific time zone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's an honour to have you. Thank you. Well, Absolute pleasure. And hey, chat. Hey, let's see who we've got. We have got Snorder Poopers, our favourite polar bear. Hello. We've got Project Storytime. Great to see you. We've got Dave Bob. Good morning, Dave Bob. Good to see you. We've got Keely Chow. Roll Ty Keely. We've got Mr. Hyde. Good morning to you. Great to see you. We've got the Bash brother, Chris Persia. Hello, Chris. Mm -hmm. Good morning. We've got the lovely Leia Rose. Hello, honey. Good to see you. We've got Deep Bud Martin. Good morning. Let's me scroll up and make sure I've not missed anybody. I know we had uh, Gum Bunny. I saw Gum Bunny. Hey, sweetheart. Good to see you as well. I think that's everybody. Uh, Nearsighted Cyclops. Hey, good to see you. I hope you're all doing well. And Strike a Dwarf. We've got a, a great bunch this morning. We always do. We have an amazing chat. Uh, D Bird, D Bird Martin. Good lad. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mm. Obviously, we had a very sad loss uh, last week. I believe he passed on Thursday night, but we found out mm. early Friday morning that um, the late great Meatloaf was no longer with us. Um, yeah. I wanted one to... bites the dust. I know. I, I yeah. and this one it hit me hard. I, it harder than I thought it was going to, because he was somebody that I, I grew up listening to, and I saw mm. your fantastic uh, tribute to him. And I just wanted oh, to kind you. of reach out and say, you know, uh, kind of get your views and were you were well, a fan. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I didn't. The video I did was was I tried to keep it a little bit shorter than it might have been. It could have probably gone mm -hmm. on for about two hours, um, but the. The bat, bat Out of Hell particularly um, had such a huge impact on my generation and myself because I was a high school. I was at high school then, and this was an uh, an album that was kind of made for high school teenagers, really. <laughs> what? Uh, and the, so the, the, there wasn't a in that sort of seventy eight seventy seven period. There wasn't a high school party that didn't have Bat Out of Hell playing at it. Literally every part we had, let's get Bat Out of Hell on. <laughs> so it had a huge impact on my age group. I mean, we're talking 14 or eight years or, or so. And that's just, this album was larger than life. Then. It was a larger than life figure. Mm -hmm. And it was something fairly new uh, in, in rock music then to have this Wagnerian Pavarotti type, but singing all these great rock and roll songs you know so it made a huge impact on us he really really did have a unique voice and we were talking briefly in the in the green room before we went live and we were saying is this because he had such a um, deep connection to the stage because he was a theatre performer as well and he brought a lot of that to his live performances as well as to his uh, mm. when he was recording he did. I think it it required, and Steinman talks about that in the the this, the fantastic if everybody looks for it the classic album series BBC classic albums. Yes. We do a great episode on on Out of Hell, and Steinman talks about it. He said we needed someone that had that act, those acting chops. It wasn't just about singing; you had to sell the character. These are stories. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he had that backed in background, so he would started out in, in musical theatre, both in LA and then in Broadway with Air, which he didn't necessarily have the best experiences with, but he kept going back to back to it. Um, and then, of course, the Rocky Horror Show on stage, <laughs> and uh, where he actually played two parts. He played Eddie, who ended up in the movie as, but I think he did the narrator as well. He, he did. did, yes, he did play yeah. the narrator as well. Yeah, and I remember hearing stories about him playing Eddie on uh, in the live performance and the director was saying you know we've had guys that have having you know they're having a lot of difficulty with this song so just kind of do your best with it and obviously he nailed it first time because that's the type of singer that he was you know, right. he was able to perform these very fast-paced songs yeah and he, he uh it, it the, the the ability to sell that 
a song. We were talking about this, as you say, in the, the green room. Mm-hmm. Um, because these are stories, you can't just go out there and sing them. If you look at Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, the, the different sections, you've got to be able to sell that. You're not just yes. singing that. <laughs> You're playing <laughs> that part. You're telling uh, a story, exactly. Yeah. And a lot of people in rock were kind of, he said, he got a lot of resistance. They said, well, you're not really, this isn't rock, this is musical theatre. Not at all. These were, Jim Steinman was writing rock, rock opera epics. Yes. Uh, just because you, I mean, my, the equivalent I would, would, would say is, is the Who doing Tommy. Roger Daltrey had to play Tommy. He didn't just go out on stage and sing the songs. Well, that's what Meatloaf was doing with these songs. He wasn't just singing them. He was playing those characters. And without that, uh, it would never have been the same. It would just mm-hmm. be an album of songs. Instead, it turned into this thing, which is like quasi-operatic, but then with this 50s-style rock and roll mixed in there. Which is, it just, there's nothing like it. That's why it's so successful. There's nothing else like that album. I think so. And you bring up um, Paradise by the Dashboard Light, and I think that's one of the best examples as well, because you've got the back and forth between between the him and his obviously his female um, singer as well. And then if you see if you've ever seen it live, they're pretty much acting out the roles as well. Mm, oh yeah, and the, the, it's it's it was also fun to see this guy, this 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 big guy. I mean, let's let's be honest, oh, with yeah. it. he was a big he, guy. He was a big dude. The, <laughs> Playing this kind of Lothario type, you know, um, sexual figure with, you know, wooing the ladies and having the ladies being wooed back by him, <laughs> even though he's this big, sweaty guy, you know, and it's, he's, but he's full on masculine with it, you know. Uh, yes, a, with the with the frilled shirts and the um, silk handkerchiefs, yes, yeah, I remember it, it well. <laughs> It, it's like we've never seen anything like this, and and uh, this again, I think you can find it on YouTube. But the, uh, for those non Brits watching, there's a, a famous British rock show called The Old Grey Whistle Test, mm-hmm. and that was on for years from the 70s through the 80s and 90s. And it had great live performances by music acts. It was a serious rock show, which is you know, and the BB given the BBC only had limited airtime, you know, it was the primary rock show, and so they. They had a meatloaf on live do it with his band doing two or three tracks from from um, Out of Hell, particularly Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. And Carla DeVito, the the female singer, although she didn't do the album, but she she no. was did the, the the live performances. She's on. <laughs> Her and Meatloaf are doing Paradise with the Dash were like they're grabbing each other and they're pushing each other away and they're all over each other and then they're pushing each other away and they build that tension up all the way through <laughs> the song until they stop right there and she really belts it out. The other thing I remember as a teenager though is watching this and, and she's wearing this black dress, <laughs> loose black dress, yes. no bra. And she kept standing to the side of the camera going like this as she's dancing and all the presenters are like, <laughs> Did she just do that, you know? <laughs> As a 14 year old, man, wow, this is great. I've never seen anything like this. So the whole I'm suddenly thing, a fan, yes. I'm, so, I'm suddenly a, a big hardcore <laughs> fan of this song. As, <laughs> it was it was a great the whole thing was so memorable. Um I mean they'd shown the Bat Out of Hell video. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, or a film, really. I mean, these were films in those days. It was filmed on I think it was filmed on actual film, not video, which is an epic clip if you've ever seen it and they showed that and it got so much reaction they showed it again the next week and then they got so much reaction they had to invite him on live and <laughs> and this is why Meatloaf was a huge star in Britain long before he was ever you know they took a year for Bat Out of Hell to make it in America and I think they had to really work the live circuit hard and bring that performance to the stage to get it to work you know touring yes. bro- broke acts in America in mm-hmm. those days, and uh, but in Britain, it, it, TV was more effective, and he became a huge star overnight. Yes, we had a lot of kind of those live kind of music shows that we need to be used to because I remember things like Top of the Pops was hugely popular for mm. many many years, and that gave a lot of acts um, a big break and a big audience. Mm. Um, so I can fully see him being very <laughs> comfortable in that sort of environment. Yeah, well, you could reach twenty million. 
people in Britain just by mm-hmm. a one television performance, you know, whereas in America, obviously it was a lot harder, a lot more regionalized then. I mean, it's possibly different now. And, you know, forgive me, Americans, if I'm mis- <laughs> uh, misquoting anything, uh, you know, maybe it was different. But that took a lot out of him, though. This yes. is why he had recurring um, episodes throughout his career, particularly after Battle of Hill. He was exhausted after that. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, he drove himself to exhaustion. Uh, there has been, especially later on in life, many of his live performances where he collapsed due to mm. dehydration or because he had very bad asthma later on in life. He mm. just couldn't perform the way he once did. Yeah, there's no half measures with an act like Meatloaf. Mm-hmm. He had to, he said, I've got to put everything into it. You can't just go out there and, yeah, you know what, I'll sing Bat Out of Hell and you know, I'll just stand here. And <laughs> There's none of that, you know. <laughs> it's full on. And, and of course, he dropped all that weight later as well. He became actually quite, you know, well, he was a big guy. So he actually, when he dropped the weight, he looked like a big, strong guy. He looked pretty good. You know? Yes, he, he was really, especially in his prime, like you say, when Bat Out of Hell first came out, he was a very big gentleman, definitely. <laughs> and he had the, the long kind of wild hair and he just, he had that kind of manic look about him. Yeah, in fact, uh, well, we'll probably pull up a couple of pictures later when I get a couple of photos. But um, <laughs> one thing I wanted to shout out was, and uh, I've, you know, many people who've uh, watched or chatted to me know that I, for a, for a while, I lived in Dallas in Texas, um, and Dallas was where he was from. He's actually yes. a Texan from Dallas, and and not a lot of people realize that because he went to LA as a teenager and then over to New York because of the chasing the career. But mm-hmm. he was actually a Texan in the, uh, you know, and he certainly was was proud of that and referred back to it a lot and did Texas Hall of Fame stuff or whatever. But yeah, it was uh, so well done. Meatloaf or Marvin. <laughs> yes, yes, Marvin then later changed it to Michael as he got yeah, older. Yeah, he kind of flipped his name a couple of times there. Yeah, Marvin Lee Addy, but uh, good old Texan boy. But uh, yeah, that all that out of hell is is was even the artwork there. And I'm, forgive me, the name of the artist keeps escaping me. He did a lot of that artwork. What yes. an iconic image. I can't remember the name of the artist. Let me just yeah, see if I, I had can it pull on the it tip up. of my tongue the other yeah. day. But, um, but I know well, it's it, been it's been emulated many many times over the over the years. So. Yeah, but there, you go. Uh, there we it go. Was so there's... But uh, out of yeah. hell and back into hell as well, and it's it's yeah. the same iconic artist. I don't know, let me yeah, pull that really, up. There so we there's, go. There's uh, the early the young meat. <laughs> yes, there he is. Young meat. Yeah, it's in here. I think this is from the hair era. Which he certainly had, but the fringed buckskin jacket and all that—that that was very, <laughs> very early seventies. And I think he met Jim Steinman around about nineteen seventy-four, whilst whilst doing this kind of stuff. And I think Steinman was was kind of in that New York scene, uh, yes. trying to write new musical theatre, but very much from a rock and roll perspective. And they just kind of hit it off. I think they had yeah, the same. They- just kind of clicked didn't they they had very similar um obviously goals and they just really hit it off pretty much immediately even though they fought quite a bit if i (laughs) am correct (laughs) well he tells it he tells that great story of how the um the he says we never argued apart from the time when i threw the piano (laughs) over when we were arguing Okay, so you did argue then. <laughs> so you did argue, yes. <laughs> so you just overturned the piano and then they had to glue it back together with bubblegum or something. I don't know. Some, <laughs> uh, but they, and, you know, I guess su- suing each other doesn't count either. But uh, <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship, uh, clearly. But they, they was, worked. Yeah. But they brought the best out in each other. You couldn't have had um, Steinman's powerful operatic songs without Meatloaf's voice to carry them. You know, it just would not have worked. It's a partnership made in hell, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but the the other, the just to focus, and we will, you know, focus on Bat Out of Hell because it is such a huge uh, part of our lives. And the other aspect of that was, um, if I can find it, was the third part of that that thing was Todd Rundgren. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd seen here pictured on the back of his. Uh, 1971 album something anything uh where he played all, he virtually played all the instruments himself and this is a great double album if you've if you've ever hear it and it's where he first does the motorcycle guitar 
that yes. features so heavily on, on Back Out of Hell as a track on this album, he does it. I actually think I've got another picture of the uh, gentleman in question. So Todd was uh, a, oh, a well a well known. Um, this is with his band Utopia, who pretty much played all this, the music on Back Out of Hell, because Todd Todd was a kind of a weirdo himself, bit of an oddball, <laughs> and and he immediately saw the potential in these demoed piano vocal tracks that they did for Back Out of Hell, and they had Bearsville Records, his own label, and his own studio, and he said, "Yeah, I think I could get this. I get this. I know what to do with this." And he saw the, immediately the scale of it. It had to be operatic. It had to to have the huge sound. It had to have, the, you know, the backing vocals had to be right. He just had ever he he got it, and that triumvirate was what was needed in order to just make that something special. And he's a great guitar player. Um, yes, yeah. It's like that, you say, all of these little bits came together to create something amazing. Yeah, I, I absolutely yeah. love that album. And Chris, just quickly, he says, um, comic book artist Richard Corbin was hired for Bad Out of Hell, whilst Marco mm. Whelan created the cover for Back Into Hell. Thanks Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, but yeah, the, the motorcycle guitar bit, again, if you watch classic al- the classic albums episode, he said, Meatless got a big section, he says, we watched Todd Rundgren do that live in one take. <laughs> And he isolates the audio of it, and he's got the. He just says, "Oh, I can do. You want a motorcycle crashing? I can do that." And he goes over to the amps and twiddles a few knobs and goes, "Here we go." And he does that whole thing, and then he goes up into the solo at the end. And he says he did that in one go, and we're just like, "It's incredible." Yeah, and it's great stuff. So all that just came together. But the music is great, and Jim Steinman's writing is fantastic. But you couldn't do that without the right guy to interpret, to front mm-hmm. it, to have that vocal with that huge, as it's like Pavarotti type vocal, but with rock and roll. Yes, and if you think back to the very end of the song where he holds that note, that's a difficult note to hold um, as Bad oh, Out of Hell ends. Yeah. yeah. You hear that when you hear it isolated, it's when you really hear what he could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we move remove the music, and then when he when he does it live and and TV shows just without any backing music backing those those songs like Heaven Can Wait, he just sings those notes. He had a pure voice as well as a, an opera r- rock voice, mm-hmm. which was interesting. He did have the range. You know, you could do plaintive, you could do personal, and then he could just do that belting out thing. And there's very few guys can do that. I mean, um, Roger Daltrey did it with Tommy, and and yes. Uh, there's, there's um, some of those guys, maybe more metal guys like Rob Halford have got that kind of range, but uh, he just tends not to do plaintive very well. <laughs> I'm sure the chat have got their ideas about who can, could match that, but not many guys could do that. You can either do the belting bit or you can do the... The softer, melodic, softer yeah, m- m- melody, yeah. That range, yeah. But yeah, he did exhaust himself touring Bat Out of Hell um, for a year, and that's why... When it came to the follow-up the um, uh, that Steinman wanted to do, Bad for Good, which mm-hmm. is a good album, but obviously... It Steinman is a good album, the, yeah. Steinman did the vocal, but it just wasn't the same, and the songs were great. And it had the same Todd Rundgren music, uh, doing the music, but uh, Meat had his voice, had, he'd lost his voice, he just was exhausted. And that, I was pleased that later, he re- when they did Bat Out of Hell 2, that they took certainly Rock and Roll Dreams Come Through, was on that album and became a single with Meatloaf singing it, which was the way it was intended. That's a great song. It is a great song. And there's a big kind of gap between them because we were talking about it as well. And obviously it mm. didn't come out until 93, Bad Out of Hell 2. Um, yeah, so that, was, that's quite a substantial time between the two. Yeah, I guess it's about 14, 15, 15 mm-hmm. years. Maybe. Yeah. My math was never my strong point. And then uh, and- Bad Out of Hell 3 was 2006, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. And I actually think that's a good idea, spacing them out like that. I mean, it gave time for certain songs to, to gestate. And uh, when Back Out of Hell 2, 2 came out, um, rather than just rushing it out as a, oh, look, we've got a sequel. <laughs> I think Steimer had the time to to, to, to yeah, mature. They both matured a bit. They were still pretty young when Back Out of Hell was done. And yes. And those songs on Bat Out of Hell, it's hard to, to, to think about it because Bat Out of Hell was such a huge success and you know, others in the movie have got more um, uh, idea of the numbers, I think 60 plus million 
copies worldwide still sells mm-hmm. hundreds still, of thousands every year still sells yeah out of hell two sold over 20 million copies uh, you know it's not I, by any means <laughs> a failure. that's that's not a failure you know and i love but out of hell too because it's got one of my absolute favorite songs of all time i do anything for love now i yeah. adore that song it's got to be the 12 minute version if you're going to listen to it i hate that you know if it's played on the radio it gets chopped down to about yeah. you get the there's like a nine minute version and i think there's a, the well, an even shorter version it's not the same is it it's not the same no yeah. and i always like... always remember the um the video because it was um <laughs> it was it was directed by michael bay god help me <laughs> I know he did that, yeah, and he did a few music videos as well. And Michael, Bay, but yeah, uh, it, it didn't feature more um, ships exploding or you know, <laughs> islands getting. It had a helicopter in there. Anyway, he did have a helicopter. <laughs> uh, Michael, uh, you know, there's the odd Michael Bay that's pretty good. I, I, I have a sneaking liking for some of it, but yes, uh, I guess it needed an epic director <laughs> to do an epic song. But Eleven it, minutes long, isn't it? it was, the, the, yeah. yeah, it's the longest single in history. Mm-hmm. It yeah, makes Hey Jude. It makes it, Hey Jude look like something that was just dashed off as an afterthought. You know, six minutes. Well, that's nothing. Yeah, you've you got Hey Jude that. and Inner Garden of Vida. I know it's, it's long as yeah. well, but I think this one is um, even longer. It's <laughs> eleven plus minutes. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've always wondered: Have we ever really answered the question of what he wouldn't do? Yes, actually, um, so. <laughs> that's that's come up a lot, and people have talked about it over years. And Meatloaf has said um, there was a back and forth between him and Steinman. He said Steinman said people will get it, don't worry about it. You know, they'll listen to the song. And Meatloaf said they're not going to get it. <laughs> but it, yeah. it, it, you, you're told throughout the song what he won't do. Yeah. It's it's before each of the choruses. So yes. what he won't do is lie, uh, forget the way you feel. Uh, forgive myself if we don't go all the way. Uh, do better than I do it with you. Stop dreaming of you every night of my life. Uh, see it's that neat, it's time it? to yeah. move on. And <laughs> the last thing she accuses him of is screwing around. Which is ironic, considering the song that the the uh, that Steinman and Meatloaf did as a demo uh, was was it called "More Than I Can Say" or "More Than I Can Give"? Mm-hmm. Where he basically, it's a, a song where he talks about his girlfriend being with a whole bunch of guys sleeping with his girlfriend. <laughs> and he's like, I, and I still love you. Okay. <laughs> so these weren't really love songs. Yeah. No, because you had um, Gonna Love Her for the Both of Us. That's him basically saying, you know, yeah. I'm kind of moving somewhere yeah. else. And um, two out of three ain't bad. I know, I, I can want you and need you, but ain't no way I'm ever going to love you. It's just perfect. It's, it's an anti-love love song. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so if you're the girl listening to that, you're going, okay. Is that a, is that a compliment? I don't, that doesn't feel like a compliment. That's yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> That's right, okay. So you're, basically you want me to put out. And, yeah. But yeah, I kind of like that. There's a lot of anti or... Going is and of course paradise with the dashboard light. It's like yes. oh, I'm only and there's a give lot of humour in that song as well. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 like uh, and it's very teenage. If you're a teenager, you're like, come on, yeah, you know, you want to get you're in the <laughs> car, you're like, yeah. no, 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 it's got to be love, it's got to be love. You know, they both want it and they don't want it, and then of course, well, they're praying for the end of time. Yes, <laughs> they'll never break their promises, but. <laughs> but uh, should have waited. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's uh, young, young lust uh, given its proper reward. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I love that kind of aspect of it. These were not just love ballads. Or, um, even heaven can wait. You know, it's that's it's a great love song, but it's full of dark overtones and undertones. And, yes, um, there's there's a lot of depth to the to the songs, and I think people kind of, especially at least recently or in the past few years i've kind of written meatloaf off as being quite cheesy you know he's quite because he yeah. was so operatic and i think until you actually sit down and really listen and l- listen to the lyrics you don't kind of realize how deep some of these songs actually were that's right yeah they're not just nothing about the this his work with steinman was just dashed off 
Uh, hail brightest day, by the way. Hey, Zach. And hey, everybody in the chat. Thanks for joining us. This is it's great. Appreciate you being here and listening to my inane rambling. Um, but yeah, there's nothing shallow about this, this stuff, you know. It's uh, that's why he needed that acting to 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 bring it through. And but even his his um, you know some of his other material. Uh, I do like Midnight at the Lost and Found, which is more mm -hmm. of a straightforward uh, rocks rock album. And it's, there's some really great songs on there and and to me it's uh i love that americana thing these are like songs about america and the american yes. experience <clears throat> and and i love those songs too the you had the pipes yes indeed dave bobby certainly did indeed uh, but yeah it's a very uh, and that's funny that he became huge first in in australia and then britain and it took a mm -hmm. little longer in america because it's very american it is, and that's why it surprised me. I thought he was going to be this huge kind of homegrown hero, and then he came over to Europe, where he was huge in Europe, and as you say, Australia, and and he was huge in Britain as well. But it's it's odd that it took a lot longer, or it took a lot more hard work yeah. for him to you know to get the real, recognition. It's really <laughs> an American experience. A lot of these mm -hmm. these albums, the songs that he's, he's singing, uh, and it's I, I guess. It's not uncommon. I mean, you look at record labels, and record companies, they, because they touted this thing, even though, even, so, so Todd Rungan's label, Bearsville, they wanted to put it out in that, but it was owned by Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers rejected it. And he said, <laughs> it's my, you, you own my label. I've produced this with my own money. It's Todd Rungan paid for the sessions. I want to put it on my label, and you're telling me no. You know, and so they had to tout it around all these labels and executives, and they all, oh, no one's going to like this. Nobody likes this. They didn't. Record labels are like that. They don't really listen to anything. You know, they were looking for the three minute single. Bang, bang. Yes, yes. Radio something friendly. that you can play on the radio, exactly. Yeah. And Meatloaf so Blessing was not radio friendly. <laughs> no, and they've got this Jim Steinman and this, and Meatloaf standing there performing stuff with the piano. In front of them, and it's like, who's this big guy? <laughs> Wasn't he in here? A Rocky Horror Show, you know? <laughs> uh, they didn't quite get it, and that happens a lot. And, and to be fair, I mean, it's, nobody got it until until the whole picture was seen. So. Yes, yes. Like you say, it is a performance, and I would have absolutely loved to have seen him live. I tried a few times over the years, but circumstances mm. just kind of kept getting in the way. The last time I tried was when he was here, I think it was 2007, and that's when he started mm. to get really, really sick. Uh, I think he collapsed a couple of times yeah. doing a lot of the live shows. He and did, yeah. You, you could see his voice was failing him by that stage. Yeah, he did have a lot of health issues over the years, and uh, it's yeah, it's the physical performance required. It, it did. He, he certainly there's lots of clips of him collapsing on stage and whatever. It's, mm -hmm. it's a real shame. Uh, but lovely personality. Um, he was on a lot of British shows and certainly American yes. chat shows too. But he appeared in a lot of British British chat shows. Uh, British comedy shows. He was always a very welcome guest because he was he was very warm, but larger than life. So he, yes, he was very witty. I, yeah, he was, a lot of the yeah. interviews I've seen him, he's, he had a very quick wit. And made a great presenter on shows as well. There's a number of doc music documentaries he was the presenter for, and he's, he's a very funny guy. I don't know if, I mean, I have a clip of him on a British comedy show. I don't know if we can show it. It's a BBC show. I don't want to get your channel... Uh, um, there's no I'm music to, in it. But. There's no music, but the BBC tend to be quite hot about they, copyrights. Uh, so. <laughs> so there's a great clip of him on Never Mind the Buzzcocks, which uh, is a British uh, quiz show, rock music quiz show, with a lot of comedians on it and a lot of rock stars. Uh, I don't think it's still going, but... It, it, it's, no, it's not, so unfortunately. Fantastic clip of him when he's on the team, and he's he's absolutely hilarious. And eventually gets up and kiss, kisses Mark Lamar, the host, and it's it's just hilarious. <laughs> funny. He he really got into the swing of it, you know. He's answering the phone, trying to trying to answer the phone on the show, and if you ever watch it, it's hilarious. So, um, yeah, he he became that that huge personality, and and they had the parallel acting career, uh, mm -hmm. which was great. And he was in a lot of stuff. I mean, you think of him mainly for Rocky Horror Show. I mean, he was in Fight Club, where a lot of people oh, remember Paulson. him. Yeah, yeah. In, in Fight Club, yeah. he's 
His name was Robert Paulson. Exactly. Robert Paulson, and he, he had the. Uh, I don't know if they're doing it. You get into trouble. He had his, his, there's the bit where Edward Norton's hanging him, and he says, he's, "I was right between his bitch, bitch tits." <laughs> now your turn to cry. <laughs> I mean, he really showed his acting chops in that because that's not an easy part to play and come. Yeah, because it could be seen as ludicrous, but. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, or fat out of hell. That's a good one, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, he did um, Rody, which he was perfect for, and the film Rody, Leap of Faith. Uh, I had yes. a, a list of the ones that I certainly recall seeing him in Wayne's World. Oh, Probably he, under he, Wayne's yeah. World, yes. Yeah, everyone's girlfriends in there. Um, <laughs> Pick of Destiny was Jack Black's dad, and uh, but maybe. Many others. I think it was in about over 50 movies. And, uh... He was. He had a substantial career. And I, just going through it when I was looking you know, at his kind of catalogue, of, I didn't realise just how prolific an actor mm. he actually was. Even yeah. though these were kind of small, a lot of them were cameo parts. You know, he he really did put his all into them. Yeah, there was mo- at least 50 movies, a lot of TV uh, appearances and, and various shows. And uh, I think, yeah, he showed his acting chops there, which... Was what he brought to the table, as well as the the, vo- the operatic vocal style. There's very few guys like that. He was unique. He was unique, I think. I think he I was, like yeah. And I think, like you said, that as we were talking, I think that definitely comes down to his love of being not only um, a singer uh, but a performer. You know, he he was definitely he had theatre blood in him. And he he brought it out in his live performances, and he brought it out uh, even when you was talking about doing you know um, interviews and things. You know, it was this large in the life kind of bombastic personality that he brought, and that's mm. what endeared him to a lot of people. Oh yeah, he was actually an actual star. I mean, even in uh, for generations beyond, after Bread Out of Hell was huge because of these TV appearances and whatever, he remained hugely recognisable and popular. But the, the records continued. I mean, Bat Out of Hell 2 was huge. Out of the frying pan, somebody mentioned earlier, was one of the mm-hmm. singles, a yep. great single. Uh, then Bat Out of Hell 3, I mean, still sold multi-million dollar, uh, uh, you know, multi-million copies. Um, you know, the, he didn't neglect the music because of the... the uh, Acting, the tours, multiple tours, great performances with orchestras. I think there's one in Australia, particularly. It was, it was really mm-hmm. good. Um, yes, it remained I think, a huge uh, star. Chris mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, it remained a huge star there. And that's a great setting for rock in general. Uh, I love some of these um, concert and, and rock star type things. There's a whole series of them in Germany that I, I've seen a lot of where they get these guys to come on and do their classic stuff with the full orchestra and a rock band. Mm-hmm. Uh, Meatloaf songs were entirely suited to that. Yes, he performed at the proms once, if I remember correctly, mm. with a huge yeah. orchestra, and that really kind of elevated the the music. You could yeah. see, you know, it really, really brought oh, that extra yeah. something to it. Ar- if that was at the Royal Albert Hall, which I think it was, which I've mm-hmm. done a few things there, it's just perfect for that sound. It's so good in there, and the atmosphere is so good that it was just that, that that would have been amazing. I actually, I, I have to say, I never saw him live either. There are certain acts that the timing, given my mm-hmm. the things that happened in my life and places I've been there were where their peak touring years, I was perhaps in the wrong place or not able to go to gigs or yes. it, just, it never happened. And um, I bitterly regret that. I mean, there's certain other acts I've never seen either. He's, he's uh, one of them. Just never happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I've certainly got a couple of DVDs and... Uh, Yes, I've got yeah. most of his albums. I mean, I've seen a lot of his live performances, but to have actually kind of been able to experience it, that's mm. that's one big ex- regret. You never exactly. experienced the full meatloaf. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> the, full, the full meat. <laughs> the full meat, absolutely. I was um, promised myself I wouldn't go there, but it's too late now. Just just go with it. That's, that's fine by me. <laughs> And just quickly, um, I just want to say uh, my condolences to MB Geek. Um, he that. he said uh, my wife lost her mum this morning. Devastating. Aww. She said I lost my best friend. I thought I would have more time. I'm so sorry, Jesse. Uh, sorry, MB. Yeah. Our condolences. Well, 
Well, we're we're thinking and praying for you, and uh, absolutely. I hope I hope your wife's okay as well. Yeah. Well, at least yeah, you you're with her and you're together, your wife and you. So support each other. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're here for you too. You know. We are. Great, we are. We're here for this you. Fellowship. Yeah. And it goes back to what we're talking about as well. You never know how much time you've got with people. You don't. And, yeah, treasure every moment, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's hard to say when you're in the uh, throes of living, you know, that you think, oh, yeah, there's always tomorrow. Well, sometimes there isn't, you know, and uh, and we lose these great artists as well. Like, uh, we'll never get to see this guy alive now. You and I, we've never seen him and it's, it's never going to happen. But uh, mm -hmm. not the same, I'm not comparing that to losing a relative by any No, means. not at all. But uh, it, it, it does come as a, a shock. Were you surprised when you heard the news? Because I, I know I was. I mean, I knew he'd had health issues, but this isn't kind of anything new. He's had health issues for quite a long time. I was surprised. It was, it, we didn't. Yeah, there was no indication that this was actually coming. No, I guess he maintained his privacy, which is good, him and his mm -hmm. family. Um, you know, there was no news article saying, you know, Meatloaf is, is in the hospital or whatever. So it was. it did come as a bit of a surprise, to be honest. Yeah. Yes, he always seemed to be quite a private guy, especially when it came to his family. Um, you know, he, he would give lots of interviews and he would talk about his career and about his music and that sort of thing. But when it came to his family, to his daughters, uh, I, there was a real kind of, uh, this oh, is yeah. private, this is what he we don't talk about. And, and I think, yeah, I think that's probably one of the, the best things that he did, you know. I kind of like that because you get so many artists these days that are are their their life is their is it you know they 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 expose everything, yes. celebrity couples particularly and you know everything is exposed everything is public you know every tweet every picture every whatever and and there's no separation for their family and I, I I'm not in necessarily interested in their personal life I want the I like the artist I want the artist that's why I don't want to hear them talking about politics or whatever I just yes. want the artist don't care about their who they've slept with that week. Or I just certainly don't want to see them <laughs> exposing their kids to stuff like you know, certain yes. actors do sometimes. Or I or, hate to see that. And I think a lot of that came from Meatloaf's kind of upbringing because he had quite a troubled childhood, if I remember correctly. He yeah. um, he, especially with his, his father, I think he had a lot of issues with and um, he was very, very close to his mother. And when his mother passed, mm. that hit him incredibly hard. And I think this whole kind of idea of wanting to kind of shield his family that's where that came from yeah and create a persona mm -hmm. bury yourself in personas and uh yes he shares that that's it's really the loss of a mother beloved mother does share uh he shares that with a lot of artists like john lennon paul mccartney and others and it, and it does kind of influence their work going forward you know particularly the songwriting perspective um you know as young young guy a young guy losing your, your mother like him, he probably did have an impact on his work. Yeah, I think he was only nineteen as well when when she when mm. she passed. So that really kind of hit him hard. If I remember correctly, he actually kind of secluded himself for uh, three months in a in an apartment because he just didn't want to to speak to anyone. Yeah. It was his friends that eventually tracked him down and kind of brought him back and kind of helped him back yeah. to where he he needed to be. Yeah, and it's good that he had such friends, and and you know, even Elvis, you know, lost his mother, beloved mother, and uh, only he was a little bit older. Uh, it does make a, a difference. Everything, everything shapes an artist, of course. Uh, yes, but I think absolutely. That, that possibly he was able to use some of those feelings in in his uh, performances. You know, I think that's it. It shapes them, and it and it sometimes. Um, results in good things from bad you know mm -hmm. uh, bad for good in fact <laughs> <laughs> yes you were talking about creating a persona and that's definitely what he did because if you've ever heard him talk he had real anxiety he did not like being in crowds of people he didn't like being yeah. in you know among parties he didn't like to be among people that he really didn't know he was much more uh, happy just to be able to hang out with musicians you know to talk music and to just work that's that's what made him happy yeah it's interesting isn't it that so many artists have this thing where they're they're actually scared of 
the thing they do in a sense. You know, they don't like to be, and yet they, they they're they're shy. Mm -hmm. He was introverted. Groups. They're yeah. introverted. Look at Freddie yeah. Mercury, an extremely quiet and introverted guy on camera, off off stage. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he certainly had his his wild times as well. But um, <laughs> put him up on a stage, and it's like all of a sudden the world is their their st stage. You know, yeah, off stage, it's like oh, no, keep me away from that. You know, don't, mm -hmm. don't want that. Don't want this. Funny, yeah. it's like they're drawn to it, and yet they don't like it too, you know. But it's weird. I think it's like you say, having this persona, it's like they can slip into this other character, or it's like a mask that they can put on. You know, they can focus on the performance, they can focus on music, and you know, mm. making the fans happy. Uh, and then when it ends, it's like it, it switches off again, and they're yeah, they're back to yeah. to who they really are. It's possibly a good thing. I mean, you wouldn't want to be full on like that all the time. You'd just burn. Oh out. no! <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to uh, hang on a sec. Call up another one of these great pictures. Uh, just there got a few go. which I oh, that's saved. a great one. This is Eddie, which I'd saved for my uh, show that I did. Um, I love that. I mean, he's it's, he's only in the the movie for that brief section, but mm -hmm. what an impact! And that, yes. It's the first time I'd actually seen him when I saw the movie. It was before, but uh, or not before I really and I, knew. Who he I was. love Rocky Horror Show. It's such a good musical. Yeah, and then he's like, "Who is this guy? He's, he's, he's a real rocker. Who is he? You know, he looks the part." He's, <laughs> uh, and then, of course, he meets a terrible fate at the hands of Frankenfurter. <laughs> Failed experiment gone wrong. But yeah. He's, he, but again, that five minutes and he sells it. He completely sells that performance. That, uh, he does. I, I love to see him when he's on the motorbike and, and they all scatter to get out of his way. That's right. He comes in on the bike. He couldn't get any better than that. But um, that's a, such a great movie. I've seen the, li the, the the live show a couple of times and I really wish he'd been in it. I mean, this is years later. I yes. wasn't seeing that live. But um, what a, and this fantastic album cover just... Unbelievable. I mean, it's iconic, it's, isn't it? It is. Everybody recognises that. You don't need the, the name of the title. You could cover that up. Everyone would immediately go, that's Bat Out of Hell. And they would know the songs. It's even even younger people. Yeah, I'm young ones. Young, <laughs> young, young people today. Young people today <laughs> don't know. But yeah, the the uh, the trio of Steinman, Meatloaf and Carla DeVito, um, who in no way... <laughs> exploited her female sexuality that's not what it was about not at all no <laughs> not when a bra <laughs> yeah and uh yeah i'm to telling you see the old green whistle test performance you'll know what i mean but uh, on stage the two of them just absolutely chewed it up it was great the back-to-back -back singing and uh, grabbing each other and pushing each other away they sold they it really had a fantastic chemistry and you could see that they were enjoying it as well you know they they loved what they were doing um yeah. I, I keep going back to paradise by the dashboard light but when she kind of shoves him away and he, oh, he right. reels back it's <laughs> yeah there he is on the stage and she's uh, on the set of Olga and they'd never seen anything like this before <laughs> The presenters were open jawed at what they were seeing. And then there's that scene where she's, you can see the dress she's wearing. Well, no bra. <laughs> sort of wearing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sort of wearing. <laughs> but yeah, they did this whole, so she's kicking him, she's pushing him away, he's rolling on the ground, she's rejecting him, and then she's all over him. And it was, it's, um, it's a memorable moment in rock history, I think. You know? Nobody had seen anything quite like that. <laughs> and then the Dead Ringers album, of course, which uh, yes, thankfully I I love that uh, album cover as well. I think that's amazing. It is. It's so heroic as well. I mean, if you look at the 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 guy in there, he's got the muscles. He's got muscles in his muscles. He's got muscles <laughs> in his poop, as my father-in-law used to say. Um, it, when you <laughs> the image, is, and then you see Meatloaf himself. Who's not yeah. necessarily. <laughs> It's a little bit of a disconnect going on. <laughs> it's but it's the ideal that his songs portray, which is fantastic. It's it's almost like a comic comic book. There's like Conan in here and all that. And it's a bit of almost Iron Maiden too. It's very Iron Maiden esque. It's Can you uh, imagine if they did some of these um music videos but did them animated, how great they would look. Like um oh, Bad Out God, of Hell. Yeah. That would be uh, so I, cool. Yeah. 
I imagine the whole, I mean, for all I know, there was a manga or something, but, uh, or mm. and then an anime. But yeah, you could make a fantastic animated movie out of this with these images with, uh, as the, st- the, the as the characters. But the the thing about Dead Ringers was, which was he finally, he'd, so he'd got his voice back, he'd recovered his mm-hmm. health a bit. Steinman went off and did Bad for Good, but then they did this album and it was a little bit more of a straightforward album. You could maybe hear some more Springsteen, uh, or more of a Springsteen sound than a, necessarily an <laughs> operatic sound, but he actually made Cher a rock artist. Yes, and that was weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because Cher was not a Cher's rock, not rock artist. No. no. I mean, obviously, she wasn't quite the disco diva she became after, which is just not my cup of tea or you know, material, and she's batshit crazy too. But um, <laughs> and she'd flirted with the rock world before being married to Dwayne uh, Greg Allman, sorry for eleven days or whatever, and <laughs> whatever it was. She kind of tried to become more of a rock thing, but this yeah, she she had the look, but she wasn't quite kind of there. It's yeah, like she wasn't rock imitation. <laughs> And then she made this, they made this video and it was all of a sudden it was, my God, this is making Cher look cool. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, and I, actually, I love that fr- frilled shirt. That's one of the things oh, I always think of him, great. you know, the yeah. over the top. <laughs> Not many people can carry the puffy shirt off. And uh, <laughs> but, yeah, this, so this video was, was hugely popular. I mean, this was another, yeah, another number one hit single, millions of copies because uh, people say, "Oh well, I'm bat out of hell." They'll never, you'll never be able to never top that. that. Yes, yeah. and and to be, you know, this sold massive amounts of, of albums and singles. But I remember this video was particularly popular. Mm-hmm. And I think we're talking around about 1980, 81. Yes, yes, this was like early 80s. The yeah. very dawn of the of the MTV era. There was a video <laughs> back when jukebox. MTV had music. Yes. That's right. This was a yeah when they had music. Yeah, MTV was where's the music now? Yeah, it's just, <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, this was in a video jukebox in a bar I went to uh, in in England in Wolverhampton, funnily enough, uh, in the Midlands. Where <laughs> I'll I lived probably know that bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a biker bar. It was a real rock rock biker bar, and this was the most played video on that. It's all these bikers sitting around watching. Sure. We're <laughs> going, oh, put that on again. That's great. Put it on again. That was fantastic. Boston. Oh. Boston, yeah. <laughs> and so this uh, this video just kicked ass and the song is, is I love the guitar intro to that. And then of course he bellows this out. He Obstant. really, really gives it all in that song. And he just does. quickly let me say thank you to Psycho Dwarf. Thank you, sweetheart. He says, be careful about what you pretend to be. Wise words. It is. And then later on, um, this is the 90s. I, I love what I love about this is that um, I still love his sartorial elegance, of course. Um, <laughs> the waistcoat, I love it. He's got the, he's not got the part, he's not got the frill here now. He's got it down with me. Yeah, he's got honest. it down on the, the sleeves. Uh, and he's but looking he's, uh, slimmer now. He you is. This is where he's starting to lose the weight. That's right. Uh, and he they, was much, much bigger back in the 80s and 70s. Yeah, that's right. He really had, had uh, worked a lot of that off, and he's playing that great Washburn guitar, which I love. I love those guitars, and he's got that fantastic guitar strap. <laughs> and it's nice to see him. I mean, he played a lot of guitar on stage and and records, so uh, it wasn't what he was known for. But he, you know, mm-hmm. he was he was a musician. He wasn't. Just he was. A, yeah, he just could a, play. An actor. Yeah, he mm-hmm. could play. He wasn't just an actor. And he, he certainly picked up the guitar many times. So uh, that's a great, great image. That's from one of his nineties tours. So. So yeah, some some lovely stuff, but uh, top man. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. Uh, he certainly didn't. Um, Bite of Hell is is iconic. Everyone knows that album. It'll remain yes. one of the greatest albums in rock history. But he certainly didn't end there. And it, and it's hard when you have that to come overcome that and and get make an impact with your later material. Yes, I mean, even some of the later ones, um, Hell in a Handbasket, I think, sold quite mm. well, if I remember correctly. Um, Guilty Pleasure Guilty did quite Pleasure's well. Guilty Pleasure's not bad, yeah. Yeah. These are, these are great rock albums, and uh, 
you know, you didn't need to, not everything had to be operatic necessarily. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, he did well to carve out a full career after that. There's, there's many artists don't recover from that one huge, iconic album. Yes. Fair play. Fair play I, to him. I think it comes as a testament to, one, the fantastic partnership that he had with Steinman. As you said mm. earlier correctly, you know, you couldn't have had one without the other. It's just because these two came together and produced something more than, yeah. you know, the sum of their parts. Um, and I think it comes down to just how talented Meatloaf actually was. Uh, you yeah. were talking about how versatile his voice was. It wasn't just that he could mm. belt out these kind of big operatic numbers. He could really kind of drop down and sing very softly if he needed to. You know, he could, yeah. He had a yeah. lot of range. Intimate, very intimate mm -hmm. uh, performances, but he especially did just the seven to piano, a lot of uh, live performances like that. And that's hard to do. Again, it takes as much effort as belting it out, you know, to bring it right back down to that and get connect to all these people intimately. Yeah, he's a great artist. Uh, yeah, I agree with that last one, Jennifer. I mean, this yeah, now, I mean, people say, oh, you're an old curmudgeon and, you know, there's just as much good mu modern music and, well, there is in the independent scenes, but not There is, mainstream, but mainstream, mainstream yeah. Mass-produced... Uh, computer generated, only five auto producers <laughs> auto tuned with an emphasis life <laughs> product and packet. You know, the record companies won. The they won the music wars in the end. They always, every so often, they they try and exert control. They did it after the first wave of rock and roll in the early, late fifties. They wanted to get rid of those re rebels, tame tame them, get control of the product. Then the crooners came in, and then. They lost control again when the uh, British Invasion and all the 60s rock bands started. And then they gained control again and get the mm -hmm. product. Now they've got a total grip. You've got a handful of record companies, a handful of producers. Yes. They don't want artists. They want something that can be packaged. and Something that sells, yeah. And that comes back again to radio play as well, like you were saying. Yeah, everything's to be yeah. tailored for that. We want a certain beat, a certain produced computer produced sound, auto tuned to within an inch of its life. <laughs> yeah. Easy to remember lyrics as Nemo well. That's lyrics. what I found. You don't get the complex lyrics that songs used to have or songs with deeper meaning anymore. They're very, very shallow. Yeah, yeah. There's very, very few art, modern artists. Uh, po I mean, massively popular ones. There's yes. tons of great music independent wise or in bars and clubs and, and whatever lots of great bands and whatever. they don't get that coverage though so the mainstream has got a grip of the <coughs> media coverage now it's got a grip of the radio and uh, you're not going to see uh, outliers becoming huge again uh, uh, they will i mean it, it's there's waves yeah Record it, it companies, swings it swings yeah, back around it's like, like so you wave. do get kind of blips yeah you, punk with punk punk for instance, yeah they yeah, lost punk control had grunge yeah the media and the record companies lost control of the narrative again and, yeah uh, um but, you know the, a guy like meatloaf if he started out today hard to know where he would go or what he would do yes i would be curious to see as well um i and i think now that he's sadly passed, I think there's going to be kind of a resurgence in his music. I think a lot of people are going to be buying his albums again. So maybe the younger generation will obviously get to learn more about him. And I think that's that's great. Yeah, I, I hope an, that that's the case. It is an irony in the rock world that yes. um, death is usually good for your career. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's usually um, good for your sales, unfortunately. Right. Yes, uh, uh, I know we're making light of... of Something like that, but it's just true, yeah. you know. It just it is. It is. You want to you want to have a, a resurgence of album sales? Well, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, it's not like some acts uh, spoofed in the ruffles where they spend a year dead for tax purposes, you know, so, <laughs> um, and then make a resurgence. <laughs> yes. Right, yeah. But yes, uh, I, I suspect one good thing that would come out of this is, as you say, uh, uh, perhaps audiences who weren't exposed to. Uh, Bat Out of Hell or indeed other meatloaf work would, would say, oh, who was that guy? And they go listen to it and they go, oh, didn't realise that was that. Was that. I didn't know it was so good, you know. Okay. Well, let's hope so. 
I hope so. And let me just say a massive thank you to Mexican I Man Sense to say super sticker and it's a number one fan. So thank you, Mike. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, he's a great lad. He is. We love yeah, love Mexican Iron Man. He's a, he's a good lad, yeah. We must stream again, Mike. We must. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I did notice you were talking about, obviously he's passed on, and a, a lot of people have been very quick to jump on the whole bandwagon and try to smear his name. Now, he oh. didn't really do anything too terrible, but people have still done their best to try and discredit who he was, and I absolutely despise people that do that. Yes, ghouls. They're ghouls. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, Soul-sucking ghouls leeches um unfortunately sadly there's so many of them out there in the media and in social media they can't wait to to, to put the knife in someone when they're gone and uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> what can you say it's the worst of human nature it is it's not surprising but i was very sad to see it i gotta admit and uh nearsighted cyclops says so the plan should be fake your death then make a comeback album called resurrection that's not such a bad <laughs> idea actually that's, um that's, that's a pretty yeah, good idea somebody's pro some people have probably tried it but i can't <laughs> but you could do that yeah or you could create i mean you could complete create a complete alter ego and kill them off um possibly i mean i'm trying to think of a the, who was that guy that um Garth Brooks did. He oh, did a complete alter yeah. ego. I can't right? remember who. Yeah, that was uh, weird. Um, Chesney somebody or no? That's Chesney Hawk something. Like that. <laughs> Chris Chris Straits or something or Chris Chris Gaines, something <laughs> like that. Chris Hawk only have one hit single. Like, if I, single. Yeah. I am the one Just and only. One. Exactly. <laughs> this is my one and only. Should have been the title. <laughs> um, sorry, Chesney. Um, <laughs> yeah, you could create an alter ego, kill them off. And then bring them back. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, look at David Bowie. I mean, he he killed off Ziggy. Yes. And of course, at the time, he says, "I'm retiring," and he's on stage. This is my last ever thing. I'm retiring. Well, he was killing Ziggy. He wasn't killing Bowie. You could do that. <laughs> oh, so that was a pretty clever way to do it. It was like I'm tired of this. This this act is over. I'm going to kill him off. And oh my God, <laughs> Bowie's retiring. No, he isn't. He's just killing Zoom. No, Zimmy. no, just, just the characters going. Yeah. But, just uh, before we, um, we wrap up, do you have a. Oh, we're not, I thought we were going to go for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> you got me up early. Come on. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do you do you have a, a favorite song of his? Do you have one that, you know, is your go to if you're going to listen to him? I think if I was to. I always find it difficult. It's like picking between your children when people say, have you got a favourite <laughs> album or a favourite song or a favourite band? I'm like, oh, God, how long have we got? Um, I think if we, if I was to continually to return to a song, it mm -hmm. would be, it, I, I, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yes, great song. I, I, if it was just a, one song, I wanted to play it as a, you know, I feel like listening to one Meatloaf song today, that's the one I would play. Mm. And it's more of a straightforward one on that album, but I just I just love the Phil Spector-esque anthemic quality of it, and it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful song with some great uh, guitar work in it, and it was a lovely mm -hmm. echoing huge backbeat. I love that song. It is. It is a beautiful song. It's definitely probably my top five. For mm -hmm. me, my go-to would always be "I Would Do Anything for Love." Uh, mm -hmm. I love that song. I loved it the first time I heard it. I loved it when I saw the video that was released on MTV, yeah. and I still nice. listen to it to this day. Uh, and you really do, as you say, have to listen to the full version to get what the song is about. You know, it's about this guy. And it's basically spiraling into insanity because he's mm -hmm. trying to convince the love of his life that, you know, if she can just love him back, then they can have an amazing life together. But she's been so hurt in the past that she mm -hmm. isn't willing to take the chance. And I, I love that. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is a very, very deep song. It, mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's truly deep. Um, and it's the real thing. I mean, it's you couldn't write. You can't write that superficially. Mm -hmm. A lot of thought went into that, and a lot of thought went into that performance. Uh, I would be interested to know just how many 
how long it took and how many times they reworked it to get that final thing. There's 11 minutes long. I mean, that's not... Yes, that's know, a substantial song. And, yeah, you don't even get any of his um, vocals until about a minute or two minutes in because you've got the, mm. the intro, which is all the piano, and then you don't get the, the duet part right until the end, about the ninth minute, um, when it really kind of picks up. And you realise you know, just how deep the song actually is. Yeah, I would imagine that was a fascinating experience in the studio creating that thing. It's it's not an easy, uh, you know, let's just go in and let's play the show right here. No, it's... <laughs> <laughs> There's a song I always wish that he had been able to do. And again, it was written for him, which was Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart. Yes, I would have loved to have heard a version yeah, of that. It was written for him by Stein, yeah. but it didn't. For whatever reason, it didn't happen at Meat Love Recorded. I would love to hear him record, uh, sing that. And I, I'd love Bonnie Tyler's, you know, rendition. It, you know, it's an mm. iconic song, but to have heard it from a guy's perspective, I think that yeah. would have been amazing. And he Absolutely. also did a recording of one of my favourite songs, "Stand by Me" by Benny oh, King, yeah. and I, he, he absolutely nailed that as well. Yeah, and that's an example there of you know, when people think of him just as this kind of outrageous operatic singer of these huge epics. That's a, a, one of the more straightforward songs in rock history, and he nailed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He yeah, really just, did. Just uh, a pure vocal. Uh, he didn't have to do anything else but sing, and it was great. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> and Larry Larry says Steinman wrote mini operas. He yes, did. he did. He did. He was writing stories and little operas and operettas and whatever. It's a lot of Wagnerian. It was described as you know this this especially yes. with the, the hair flowing and the with Meatloaf's hair flowing in the wind of the wind machine and the bike. And it's, it's Wagner. It was all, it was bombastic and it was over the top and I absolutely loved it. Yeah. The the other thing that I did want to just briefly touch on is there is a live um, stage play all about. So bad out of hell touring at the moment. Uh, oh. I'm trying to get tickets for it. I think they're in London at the moment. I just just miss them where I live. So if they come back this uh, way, I'm gonna you, go see it. But um, you're lucky. There's uh, still live appearances where you are. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in the Canadian gulag here. Oh, the you're, Maple you're, Curtain. <laughs> you're, Forget you're all about attending down. concerts. Yeah. Oh, God. Forget about it. Uh, we've only it's only recently that things have been lifted but uh yes sure. if yeah, i can well, get tickets i will I, I hope you can yes i hope you can <laughs> that would be lovely i mean i think we may see a return to gigs here uh later this year i've certainly got some tickets for course. concerts that have been pushed back two years and they're still scheduled for this summer so we'll see mm -hmm. cheap trick being one of them nice <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I hope you do because I, I really miss seeing live performances. Oh, you know, I, know. I, I missed going to the cinema as well, but to, to see you know, a, a band up on stage, there's something incredibly special about it. There's nothing quite like it, is there? And uh, mm -hmm. this this whole excessive lot, uh, well, I'm not a doctor. Let me see. Let me see. <laughs> perhaps a slightly over-the-top lockdown in certain areas has uh, <laughs> yes. resulted in the death of live music. And, and I mean, there's no... And mm -hmm. it's the smaller bands that it's hurting. Yes. It's the guys that rely on that income from playing live, your club bands in this area that have suffered. Mm -hmm. and well, if you've got strong. some Andrew Lloyd Webber complaining that he's not getting any income, can you imagine how it's hitting, you know, little bands yeah. and, you know, people just trying to, to make a living? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll look at the Canadian club circuit, which is mainly Canadian bands, but some bands come up from the US and they play your two, three hundred um, uh, capacity clubs. That's their bread and butter, those tours. And like the club in town here has been closed. It's been maybe open for a couple of weeks here and there and, and then they've closed it again. Those bands are, are main, making nothing now. Superstars mm. can ride it out, you know, um, and they are some of the most enthusiastic cheerleaders for these um, restrictions. So they can ride it out, but your your average club band and independent band or artist can't ride that out, and they've they've suffered badly mm -hmm. from that. Live music has suffered really badly, and uh, yeah, if even Lloyd Webber is complaining, you know things are bad. <laughs> Well, because his income's from Broadway type stuff. So. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. He's saying it's uh, 
there's just not enough people going to the to the theatres anymore. So, well, yeah. what do you expect? Exactly. Well, that's right, yeah. I'd yeah. love to know if whether he was keen on it, on these restrictions from the start or not. But uh... <laughs> Yes, and said it hit his pocket, yes. Yeah. It, is, it is curious. <laughs> Indeed, I'm not, yeah, I think I could live... Uh, with all due respect to those who love his works, I think I could probably live without most of Andrew Lloyd Webber's output myself. But yes, that... I I, th- I know what I'd rather go see. Yes, <laughs> yeah. not to say that I haven't been in London's West End to a couple of his shows as an experience, but you know, like Phantom mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But... Yeah, I've seen Phantom, but that was probably the only one. But um, you got to see it at least once, I think. Yeah, I thought, yeah, well, while I'm in town, I might as well see something like that. And. Uh... Uh, but yeah, not necessarily my cup of tea. Although there's there's a couple of um, well, he did that. Al- it wasn't it Andrew Lloyd Webber did the album Variations in the seventies, which was um, a, a more of a sort of a classic, uh, classical and rock mashup. Yes, and I quite like that. They used the they used part of it as the theme for uh, South Bank Show, and uh, so he did that. He did that. That was a good album. But that was obviously not musical theatre. It was rock music. Anyway, that's a that's way down the rabbit hole there. Way down the rabbit hole. I think that's that's a discussion for another time. It could be. There could be a whole a whole show about that. Yes, yes. And Chris, yes, absolutely. We could have done without cats. Absolutely. I think we could have. If I had a time machine, I'd probably go back and erase it. But. <laughs> just, just what what the hell were you thinking? Yes. <laughs> I don't want to make myself out as some kind of hardcore guy that doesn't like all types of music. I've got thousands of, of artists, thousands of albums. I've got everything from Abbott to ZZ Top, and I've got classical, <laughs> and I've got musicals, i got all sorts. But Andrew Lloyd Webber, I can take uh, it and leave it. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Um, I quite liked uh, One Night in Bangkok. I think he was something to do with that, or was that Tim Rice? You know, Murray I think Head. that was Tim Rice, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but the, ABBA, the, the two ABBA of them always it. were very kind of. Almost hand in hand Joined again. Joined at the hip, yeah. yeah. Rice was the lyrics, Lloyd Webber was the music. But... <laughs> was the music. Yeah. We got away from <laughs> Meatloaf there. We would probably, hopefully would have said, no, I'm not appearing in any Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> we'll write our own. Yes. He would have done his own and he would have done it yeah. brilliantly. But yeah, We'll um... write our own and it'll have motorbikes and demons and... Fire. Yeah. And fire and, you know, half-naked humans. <laughs> We'll yeah. do it ourselves, it's fine. That's right. Let's do the show right here. <laughs> but uh I I am gonna miss him. Um we've still got his music, oh. we have a massive back catalogue of, of his work, but um the world I think it's just a little bit dimmer now that he's gone. It is, and that's what happens every time we lose one of these these guys. It's it's kinda dims the lights a little bit. Uh but I tried to what I try to do and what I do in my little um yeah, uh, things as I celebrate their life. I mean, yes, I'm, you know, giving my condolences, but I'm I'm trying to celebrate them, mm-hmm. what they gave us. I'm thankful for for what they oh, gave gosh. us. Oh gosh, yes, yeah, I I am as well. I didn't want this to be sad. I wanted to uh, to to be happy and to to celebrate and you know, yeah, I, as I much as he that. gave us. Absolutely, you know, thanks for everything he gave us, and you know, you still give us because we can listen to those records, watch those live performances day in and day out still and they'll be there forever and uh, so thanks thanks to Meatloaf for that Absolutely and uh, this site Cyclops says so Purple Valkyrie won't be singing Midnight for us anytime soon <laughs> No but I have done um, <laughs> um, which is the ones that I've, I've done in the past I've done um, well pretty much the one that I've got on my uh, t-shirt Paradise by the Dashboard Lights I but think I'd like to do that, a, that duo a duet with you on that. Yeah. You and I could do a duet well, on I that. I think we but could do that. To, it would have to be live and it would have to be like the old <laughs> Green Whistle Test. <laughs> I'd, I'd be willing to do it. I've done it in the past, but it's been a while since I've I've yeah. done it. So uh... You get to kick me on stage, you know. <laughs> put a pin fun. in that and we'll see what we can do. I'm certainly starting to get put on the weight, so I might be able to do it soon. <laughs> Ah, uh, but do you have the frilly shirt? That's that's the I question that we're asking. I, I used to have a puffy shirt. I'm not. I'm just looking back at my. No, I don't think I've got one right now. But I could be arranged. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, guys. You heard it here first. It's it could happen. Next time I'm in your uh, neck of the woods, we'll we'll do it. <laughs> Find a live karaoke bar. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, 
before we wrap up and let everybody get on with their Monday, what have you got coming up, love? Well, today at 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, I have my weekly show, It's Only Talk and Roll. See what I did there? Um, <laughs> and my guest today is Culture Casino, so I'm oh, very nice. excited about culture. that. Yeah, Great culture's guy. Culture's my special guest today. We'll be talking about, we'll probably be talking about music, um, talking about uh, our respective YouTube histories uh, about the entertainment business and things like crypto, which I know that uh, culture is interested in. Oh. So uh, I like Retro Dicky, by the way, the old 70s grey whistle text. <laughs> yes. That's a good one. Uh, so yeah, that's coming up today, 2pm Pacific. Please join me for that. Um, I will be on Toxic Tuesdays uh, tomorrow night, 32 flavours of Nick nice. Visor. Toxic, I mean, we're doing Rumble in the Bronx. Jackie Chan. <laughs> That's a great not, film. It should really have been called Rumble in Vancouver because it wasn't filmed in the Bronx, but uh, <laughs> it'll be fun. Toxics is always a great show. Toxic Tuesdays is a great show. It's fun. We have a lot of fun. Uh, and then um, I'm actually going on the road, so my uh, streaming may be intermittent. I'm going to be down in Texas for a few days, assuming oh, nice. the Canadian government doesn't detain me at the border. Um, <laughs> Got to dig you out. <laughs> for crimes against uh, Kanukstan. Uh, and then I'll be over in uh, the UK like, as well. So, oh, nice. Yeah, nice. But way up north, way up north okay. in Scotland. Oh, Scotland's uh, so, awesome. And so I will be... Streaming occasionally, we shall see. I'll be popping up in chats, and I'll be on your timeline, so I'll be able to uh, <laughs> able to do to attend some of your your shows too. So that's my my upcoming stuff today. Two, two, nice. Today at two p.m. Pacific. Uh, awesome. And guys, if you're not subscribed, please do. I'll put the links below, and I will also link the the video that that seventies rock oh, fan did as well. Because it's, I, it's a great video. It really yeah, is. I really appreciate you having me on, Lass. It's it's very good of you. Thank you. Thank you very mm. much. You are welcome. It's my pleasure. Like I said, I I knew that you were a fan, and I just wanted to kind of reach out to somebody who who had a appreciation as much as I did. And I didn't like you say I didn't want this to be sad. I wanted it to be a celebration, and I I think we did. You know, yeah, I think you've we, done a great job. Him, and we've do, given him a good send off. Good send off, and uh, yeah, it's been great uh, listening to all the songs again in the in the last few days and. Same, yeah. That's yeah. pretty much what I was doing over the weekend while I was cleaning and working at just putting music on and just yeah. just reminisce. I know, and it brought back for me a lot of high, high school memories listening to <laughs> Battle of Hell parties. Some not so good. <laughs> some I, good, some not so good. <laughs> I once drove up to um, the Lake District and played the pretty much his entire back catalogue the whole way up, and yeah. it was just a great, great time. Oh, I know, and that's yeah. the days we used to do that. We had tape, we had eight tracks and cassettes, and we'd just sit in our driving up the M6. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> Exactly. Tapes. I used to do that all the time. Yeah, <laughs> up and down to Scotland, I'd drive up there and I'd have a cassette of Bat Out of Hell on. <laughs> Turn times. it up as high as it goes. Yes, yeah. that's it. And then be like this, and the other cars would be past me. Go, what the hell is he doing? What the hell is he listening to? Oh, it's me. Like it's fine. <laughs> but it's great driving music. That's that's what I always oh, yeah. think. It just yeah. absorbs you. It takes a. You, you forget what you're doing. You can't listen to it casually. <laughs> all right my loves thank right. you guys thank so you. much for joining us today a massive massive thank you to that 70s rock fan for being a fantastic co-host today i really really appreciate it my um pleasure. he will be back later on this evening so please please check that show out i know it's going to be fantastic with culture um i will be back wednesday there's always hope <laughs> it will <laughs> where you want <laughs> but weird. um it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be good i will be back wednesday as i said and then we will be back friday so lots and lots of stuff coming up guys but let me say a massive thank you to everybody who joins us today you guys were fantastic as always we had some amazing comments i want to say a massive thank you to everybody who sent super chats who sent super mm -hmm. stickers i really really appreciate it um our condolences again to mb geek um very very sorry for your loss love um, yes, indeed. If you need anything, Sorry. just reach out to us. We're we're here for you. Um, but on that note, I will say 
thank you again and guys have a fantastic rest of your day and uh we will see each other very very soon take care guys Bye.